So we're going to look, go on in Luke, and we're going to look in Luke chapter 7 about this encounter that Jesus has with a sinful woman. And you can take it that she's a prostitute, right? So let's, uh, let's just start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind, wanting to get closer to your Son, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, who we accept as our Lord and our Master and our Saviour. And we pray, Father, that you will open our eyes to him, to how he was, to how he reasoned, to his style with people. And the more we see of him, the more we love him, and the closer we stand to that fire, the more, Father, we are set on fire by him. We pray that we might be centred on him as the light and the fire, the passion of our innermost soul, and that we will connect with him in baptism, in the breaking of bread, but above all, in a life lived with him, with his spirit in us. So please open our eyes to him in all his glory, for his sake. Amen. Amen. So one of the Pharisees requested to eat with him, with Jesus. And he entered into the Pharisee's house and sat down to the meal. And a woman who was in the city, a sinner, when she knew that he was dining at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind at his feet, weeping, she began to kiss it, to, to wipe, uh, to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. She kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Well, <clears throat> what are we to make of this? There's a lot of incidents where Jesus seems to like hanging out with prostitutes. And, you know... Uh, under Jewish thinking, a prostitute was someone you didn't even go near. Um, these people were the very edge of society. And the Pharisees used to say, why do you eat with prostitutes and sinners? It was as if Jesus had some special liking for the people on the edge. And we are all the people on the edge. And you see the big difference between religion and spirituality that if a church, for example, or a synagogue in the first century Palestine had a bunch of, of uh, prostitutes and drug dealers and so forth coming to it, no decent person would go there. Oh no, I don't need some people like that. And this is the beauty of the character of Jesus, that he was perfect, he never sinned, he never committed sin, he never omitted any, any act of righteousness, he did no sin of omission, no sin of commission, but he actually liked the company of low-life sinful people and that's amazing that is amazing because the tendency is that more you know about Jesus the more sort of well let's say righteous you become the less patient you are with people who haven't quite made it for example you give up smoking and the people who hate smokers the most are ex-smokers who've given up they have a big intolerance with smokers because they gave up smoking right the lord jesus was not like that and this is a sign of his perfection that he actually liked to get involved with all the mess of human life for example often you read that he touched people he touched a leper oh as soon as you touch a leper you become unclean but he touched the leper when the widow's son died he touched the coffin Oh, you're unclean, you touch a dead body, you touch the coffin. He liked it, it says it so many times in the Gospels, that he touched the unclean. He likes to get involved. And when we think, oh, why would this Jesus who is way up there be interested in me, in all the mess and dirt of my life? No, I'm not good enough. People say this to me all the time. I say, do you want to be baptised under Jesus? And people say, yeah, well, yeah, but you know what, I'm a... I'm a sinner. Right, like, yes. And I say, ah, yeah, but you don't know how bad I am. You don't know the bad things I do. You only see me at church. Yeah, I hear you. you know, nothing you tell me would surprise me. But that's the thing, that he actually likes us as we are. It doesn't mean he doesn't want us to change, but he loves us as we are. And when they said, why do you eat with sinners, prostitutes, and so forth, he said, because I'm a doctor, and I didn't come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. So he's saying, and I didn't come to fix the healthy, 
I came to help the sick. So what he's saying is, yes, I showed my fellowship to such people. I accept them where they are, and that acceptance of them is so amazing that it will make them change. That acceptance of them just as they are will make them change. That's how the mechanism, if you like, works of people coming to repentance. It's not that Jesus says, look, here's the bar. If you can jump over that bar, I'm there for you. He says, look, <laughs> no, I just accept you as you are, right where you are. And by my acceptance of you just as you are, that will change you. This is where the love of God changes you. And as Spiro said to me, we were chatting earlier, that the, the longer and the closer you stand to the fire, eventually you're going to get burnt, absolutely. The longer and the closer you stand to the Lord Jesus, you're going to get influenced, absolutely. So, this Pharisee is invited Jesus to his home, and this sinful woman comes into the meal. And she stands behind him, the Lord's feet, weeping, and she wipes his feet with her tears, and she anoints his feet with this very expensive ointment. Now, Jesus Christ, Jesus means God saves, roughly. Christ means the anointed one, anointed one. And so she believes that Jesus is the Christ, and that's not painless for her. She anoints him, because you are the Christ for me with this expensive, very expensive alabaster box of ointment. And so, in those days, it wasn't so much a cash economy. A prostitute got paid, well, anyone got paid for services, not necessarily with banknotes like we would today, not with a bank transfer, but with something like gold or silver, or in this case, a very expensive uh, box of ointment. And you never used it, you never used it, you thought, all right, this thing's worth whatever amount of money it was worth, I will keep that. And that's like, well, I'll keep that, like a piece of gold. You might keep the piece of gold and think, yeah, in a rainy day, I'll use this. So this was her special savings that she'd got. And you can assume, because she was a prostitute, that it had a rather sad history behind it, this thing. But she pours it out on his feet. Now. When the Pharisee that had it invited him saw it, he spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have perceived who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, because she's a sinner. He spoke within himself so many times in the Bible. You read that, that a man spoke inside himself. And what is significant to God is our self talk and we all talk to ourselves you know it doesn't mean you're crazy that I talk to myself of course you do everybody talks to themselves you're not crazy because you talk to yourself everybody talks to themselves and it's what you say to yourself in your heart that is the measure of a man or a woman that is who you really are also speak to yourselves in some hymns and spiritual songs okay so it is what you say to yourself it's your self talk you know, if you're there talking all nice and nicely to somebody and thinking inside your head, you are such a moron, you are such a total idiot. But oh, very, very nice to you, yes, oh yes, you know. Yeah, God sees that. God sees what you're saying in your head, and that is why we need the Holy Spirit, a holy mind. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit that you think differently, that you are not cussing someone off in your head and acting nice on the front. No, no. So, he thinks to himself, this woman's a whore. This guy doesn't seem to get it that she's a whore, therefore he's not a man of God. Jesus said to him, Simon, I've something to say to you. He said, teacher, speak. Like, I'm very humble, I'm very humble to your word. And he wasn't at all, anyway. He said, a certain lender had two debtors, the one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. That's, call it pennies. So th this man has got two men who owe him money. One owes him 500 pennies, the other owes him 50. And you worked for a penny a day in those days. When they had nothing with which to pay, he forgave them both. Which of them, therefore, will love him most? Simon said, he, I suppose, to whom he forgave the most. And he said to him, you've rightly judged. So the more you're forgiven, 
the more you love. And you scratch your head and you think, well, does that mean that I can't love God very much? Because I, am, I have not been a murderer. I have not been uh, a paedophile. I have not been all these big sins that people like to talk about. Um, I, I haven't been that. Does that mean I can't love God? No, it comes down to perception. It comes down to how you see your sin. Because only just one sin is enough to put you into eternal condemnation. The wages of sin is death. The Bible starts this way. Adam and Eve, well, all they did was just in between the commas, they just ate the forbidden fruit. And, oh, hang. Yeah, right. But they ate it. That's it. They didn't murder, they didn't, they weren't pedos, they weren't this, they weren't that. They just ate a fruit that God said, now don't eat that one. Oh, well, I did. Well, because the other bloke told me to. Oh, bang. Really? You're damned. That's the thing. The more you realise that about yourself, then you realise, whoa, I'm in debt 500 pennies. And this is the difference between religion and spirituality. In religion, you just troop along to a building. And you sit in those four walls, be it a Pentecostal church, be it a Catholic church, be it some little backstreet church, some description or other, and you do your religion. And you go out and you live your life pretty well, plus or minus, like the bloke next to you, who lives next door to you, who's an atheist or an agnostic. And this isn't it. The point is, do you perceive how much you have sinned? Now, this is not popular to say this. People say, oh, don't give me all that stuff. Don't guilt trip me. I'm awesome. You look on Facebook and says, I'm awesome. You're an awesome person. Well, yes, you are an awesome person in one sense, but you're also a sinner. And, you know, you say this is old time, old time rock and roll sort of thing, but it is so. It is so. That if you perceive how much you have been forgiven, whoa, you will have a flame of praise and gratitude within you. You will be on fire. So Jesus says there were two people who were in debt to one man. One owed 500 pennies and the other owed 50. And the one who is forgiven 500 is going to love, love him more. And so he goes on to make the point. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, now that's rude. If I'm talking to, I don't know, Dana, uh, but I turn away from her and I talk to someone else, that's a bit weird. So you see, he turned to the woman while he was talking to Simon. It's a bit rude. Well, that's the point. And he was a guest at this guy's house. He said, do you see this woman? I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she's wetted my feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. And they were probably thinking, ah, oh, she's like perverted, that woman. And he's saying, no, no, no. She did it. She kissed my feet. Um, whereas you didn't even kiss me to say hi to me. My head with oil, you did not anoint, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I say to you that her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. So he's saying to this Pharisee, who thought he was so righteous, he's saying, You've, you're perceiving only 50 pennies debt. And that's why you didn't, you, you don't love me, do you? You didn't even hug me, you didn't kiss me, you didn't uh, wash my feet. This woman has forgiven 500 pennies, and so she loves much. But you love little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And they that sat, sat at food with him, <coughs> began to say, within themselves, and you notice that again, their self-talk is noticed. They began to speak within themselves. Who is this that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go into peace. Now, what is peace? Go into peace. In other words, the peace arises from knowing 
that you have been forgiven. That's the point. You have been forgiven and therefore you have peace with God. This is what Paul says pretty well quoting this. Now we have peace with God because we have received the reconciliation. So what is peace? Peace in the end is peace with God. And yet people tend to think, oh, peace means having enough money to be able to go on holiday in a very peaceful location and it's very nice and the hotel was lovely and the food was gorgeous and all the rest of it. Is that peace? The person is sitting there worried madly about this or that or the other. No, peace is here defined as peace with God knowing that you have been forgiven. That is peace with God. That is peace with God. Now, I know you're all at different levels in your study of the Bible, your knowledge of God, so I'm going to go a little bit deeper, and I hope I don't lose all of you, but um, some of you will find this interesting, I think. This incident is pretty well at the beginning of the three and a half year ministry of Jesus. At the end, just the week before he dies, a very similar incident occurs. Very similar. And it's in Bethany, in the house of Mary, Martha and Lazarus, where Mary Magdalene takes very expensive ointment, pours it on Jesus, and the disciples don't like it, and Judas Iscariot is furious about it and says, why was a waste of all that money just pouring out that expensive ointment on Jesus? It could have been sold for a lot of money and given to the poor. This, we're told, he said because he kept the purse. Why are there these two incidents? Here this woman is anonymous. She's called a woman in the city who is a sinner, obviously a prostitute. The one at the end of the ministry of Jesus is Mary Magdalene. Now you see why people assume that Mary Magdalene was the prostitute, because the whole thing is so similar. But the two incidents are separate. This is in the house of a Pharisee called Simon, and the one in John, which is at the end of the Lord's ministry, is in the home of Mary, Martha and Lazarus. So Mary and Martha were two sisters who loved Jesus, and they had a brother called Lazarus who died, whom Jesus resurrected. And when Lazarus dies, the Pharisees all come to the funeral. And then, oh, whoops, <laughs> he's resurrected. And they, they get mad about it. Well, I'll put this to you as a bit of uh, Bible study, putting the two incidents together. This is the same house. And... Mary, Martha and Lazarus, I suggest, were, had been Pharisees. They were in the family of, of, a, of a Pharisee's family. And why is it that Judas gets so cranky about it? He, he's furious when Mary does this. He gets mad about it. Why did she spend all that money? Who was Judas? When you read the list of the disciples, you read Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Judas Isca Iscariot, Simon's son. So do you see how I'm putting it all together? This happens in the home of a bloke called Simon. It repeats at the end of the Lord's ministry in a home where there's Mary, Martha and their brother Lazarus and Judas, the son of Simon. It was a family. Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Judas. They're all Pharisees. The son of a bloke called Simon. And that's why Judas was hopping mad when his prostitute sister goes and pours out all the expensive perfume on Jesus. Because, well, he was her older brother, or he was the man in the family, shall we say. So in their way of thinking... What you earned by your prostitution is actually mine. That's the family wealth. And you went and just blew it. You just threw it away on the feet of, of Jesus. He's so mad about it. And that's why afterwards 
He goes to the Jews and says, how much money will you give me? And I will betray him to you. In the Proverbs it says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. And it is the honor of kings to search it out. And so, I don't know if you got what I'm saying, the connection between these two incidents. But I reckon the closer you look at it, you'll see that it holds. But it's not immediately apparent on the surface, is it? It's like, you know, putting clues together. And then you get the picture. It's like a whodunit kind of, um, you know, scenario. You know, trying to find out what happened. Oh, there's this clue, this clue. Oh, then you've got the, the picture. The detective has put the story together. Because the basic gospel that the Lord Jesus died for your sins and rose again and is coming again. Uh, and, you know, he's going to save you. That's simple as. No, no problem with it. Simple as. Anyone can understand that. But <clears throat> once you've accepted it, then you go deeper. I keep saying, read the Bible every day. And you do that all your life, as I've done. And you start to see these things, and they come together. And the picture is beautiful, and people say to me, why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in the Bible? I say, well, a lot of reasons, but it's the little things. It's the little things. It's little things like this, which might be a little thing, but this, this was not contrived by man. This was not some blokes writing the gospel records. This is men and women used by God, inspired by him, so that these records are from him. <clears throat> And those who read carefully, slowly, prayerfully, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, will see the full picture. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this woman <clears throat> is the woman who has uh, 500 uh, pennies debt, and the, the man with the 50 pennies debt appears to be Simon who I'm suggesting is actually her father. The explanation I've given to you would explain something that's otherwise very odd. How is it that Simon, who is a Pharisee, has got Jesus in his house and then a prostitute walks in off the street? That doesn't sound credible. That you're entertaining someone in your house and some prostitute walks in and you let them walk in and this prostitute starts... Uh, anointing the feet of your guest. That sounds a bit odd. Wouldn't let, a Pharisee wouldn't let that happen. But if the woman was his daughter, oh yes, that would explain the, uh, that would explain it, wouldn't it? That would explain it. Absolutely, would explain it. How a prostitute came to be in the house of Simon the Pharisee and is allowed to operate and act how she wants, pouring out ointment on the feet of the guest yeah, that'll be right <clears throat> if she's the guy's daughter. He can't chuck his daughter out of his house. But it, it's got the ring of truth, that suggestion. All fits together, I would say, perfectly and nicely, seamlessly. But it's not there on the surface. Now, there is not a simple word-by-word -word explanation that there was a Pharisee called Simon who had four children, Martha and Mary, and the boys were called Lazarus and Judas. It doesn't say that. You've got to put that together. And when you scratch your head and think, why did Judas betray Jesus? Why, after Mary pours the ointment on his uh, feet, why does he get so annoyed about it and troop off, to, um, <coughs> troop off to the Jews and say, how much money will you give me and I'll betray him? Yeah, yeah it, all, it all fits. It all fits nicely. Um, <coughs> but I think... Thinking about the story, Jesus doesn't specifically say to Simon, you owed me 50 pence so you love me less. Mary owed me 500 pence and so she, she loved me more. I wonder if he's sort of hinting to Simon, you know what? Go away and think about your life, my friend. You should have, you should have anointed me. You should have washed my feet. You should have treated me nicely, nicer than you did. In other words, he's saying to Simon, do you know what? You've got a 500 penny debt. And you think it's only 50. But I'm telling you, mate, it's 500. You're the big debtor. And I think that's the hint there. And so it comes down to us. Do you recognize that the wages of sin is death? 
And do you recognise that you have messed up in your life? And that those sins were not just someone else's fault. Ah, oh, poor me. I was railroaded into it. Ah, uh, well, I did this because, I don't know, my father abused me when I was a kid, so poor victim me, I had to do this, so I had to do that. All your reasons may be true. Maybe you were railroaded. Maybe your father did abuse you, so on. But the point is, we have still sinned. For whatever reason, well, the reasons are multiple, all multifactorial, that's one thing. But once you get it, that I am in urgent need of being forgiven, I am in urgent need of peace with God, then it becomes the more wonderful to you when you realise that, wow, I have been forgiven, that, wow, it's all okay, then you will have a fire in you, then you will have a flame of praise, of gratitude, of appreciation, then you will, yeah, then. But if you're just going to stay in the religious mindset, which is that, well, I go to church not because I've sinned, um, <clears throat> but because I'm righteous, uh, to hang out with other self-righteous people within four walls for two hours a week and then go home, well, you, you're missing the whole point. For what purpose then did Jesus die for your sins? You know? That the wonder of the cross of Jesus is lost on you. If all the time you're saying, ah, well, I did, yes, I know I did that wrong, but that was because of this. And I know I did that wrong, ah, but that was really because of my ex or because of my abusive wife, my abusive husband, or whatever it may be. All those reasons are true insofar as they go. But the, it's like Eve in the Garden of Eden saying, well, the serpent lied to me. I was deceived. Yeah, yeah. Correct. <laughs> but you still did it. And Adam's saying, me, uh, well, she, my wife gave it to me to eat. I didn't pick it. Oh, my wife did. Oh, I ate it. Yeah, I know, but uh, she gave it to me. Yeah. And when you read that wonderful story with which the Bible opens, I say story, I mean it's true. I don't believe it's myth or makeup. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> Pathetic sort of five-year-old, six-year-old child excuses about my sin. And the, the, all the time we want to focus on the reasons why I did it. Well, the reasons are as they are. But the point is that the wages of sin is death. And we can do something about that. And it can be dealt with. Now, this woman does not come up to Jesus and say, Oh, by the way, Jesus, I've been a prostitute and I'm really sorry. Could you forgive me? She just comes up to him and, and shows all this love to him. And he says, That's fine. You are forgiven. Go in peace. He's not humiliating people because of their sinfulness. He's not saying, look, we need to have an interview. We need, you and me need to meet, and you've got to put it in black and white what you did wrong, and you've got to say that you're very sorry. No. He's there with open arms. Oh, you want to come and anoint me? You want to connect with me? I'm open to you. Absolutely. I am open to you absolutely and totally. Oh, really? So she comes to him and he says, yeah, you're forgiven. Your sins are many. I, I know all of them. I know every bloke you slept with. I know the whole caboose of your life. I know the whole scene. Your sins are many. I, I know. But that's all right. Go into peace. And as I say, this is the only peace that's worth having. This is not the peace of, let's say, oh, a beautiful sunset. You see a beautiful sunset over a lake over the sea, and modern man whips out his phone and, oh, isn't that beautiful, so peaceful. Snap, snap on your phone, yeah, 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 I, I got it. Oh, yeah, put it on Facebook, share it with your mates. Oh, very peaceful. So I do the peace. You know, peace. The only peace worth having is peace with God through Jesus Christ. And you won't get to that unless, first of all, there is that acceptance of human sin and failure. It's the only way. Now, we're going to do the um, <clears throat> communion. I wonder, oh, Karine, you're there. Uh, would like to, someone like to pass the bread and the juice around? Somebody want to help? She's only got two hands, she needs four hands. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Well done, thanks.
Right, so the bread <coughs> represents the body of Jesus and the cup represents his blood. Um, Spiros, would you like to come and uh, give thanks to the... For, you can give thanks to both of them together, yeah? Okay, so we'd like to give thanks to the bread and wine. Like I said, after, after we've eaten, you're all invited back to my place. We're going to baptize a woman, Maria. And um, anyone else like to be baptized, you can also be baptized. If you'd like to um, just come and be with us for some fellowship, you're also welcome. So just let me know, or Spiros, or Corinne, or Dano, or whoever. And uh, let's now give thanks for the, uh, for the food. The food hasn't arrived yet from KFC, but... We have faith that it will come. Um, I don't know, Dana or Marzena, would you like to give a prayer for the food? Would you like to give thanks for the food? No? Shy. Okay, Corinne, we have to come back to Corinne. Okay, we, we just thank, thank God for all that he does here today. We thank him for the food, for the tradition in form of everybody coming, and for Duncan's family, and everything that God provides here today. We thank Him, and we thank Him through Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.